What's going on in Greenland could have devastating effects on our environment. Ice is melting at a rate never before seen. If all of it would melt tomorrow, it would raise global sea levels with about seven meters. No matter where you live, you will feel the change. It's being blamed for extreme weather events. Sean Caleb's takes you to the heart of Greenland's ice cap for an up-close look at Melting Point, a CCTV special report. I'm Elaine Reyes, and this is a special edition of America's Now. Tonight, melting point. Sean Caleb's takes us to resource-rich Greenland, where the rapidly melting ice cap could have a devastating impact around the globe. Think about it. Much of the 1.8 million square kilometers of ice in Greenland sits above the Arctic Circle. However, last summer, it saw melting over 97% of the ice sheet, virtually the entire area. The climate change is manifested most uh, rapidly and, and strongest in, in the Arctic region right now. And here's also a region where you have some consequences that could ultimately uh, influence the, the rest of, of the planet. The melt-off is being blamed for raising sea levels, as well as having a hand in the unpredictable, sometimes violent weather around the world. It is beautiful and serene here. But why is the ice melting so rapidly? Is there something we can do to turn back the clock? How frustrating is it for you to hear people say, we don't know that this has been affected by man. This, mm -hmm. this could be cyclical. It's so frustrating. I, I don't feel frustrated. Um, I would waste my energy if I would be frustrated. It is something that we are responsible for, yes. Uh, we as a humans. Is it something that we can do about something about it? Yes. Is it something that we should do something and are we doing? I'm not convinced. Greenland, a country that is ground zero in one of the most pressing global issues, climate change. The massive ice sheet is melting at an alarming rate. Scientists are trying to determine exactly why. But Greenland is a mystery to the outside world. America's Now contributing correspondent Sean Caleb's takes us on an extraordinary journey, an up-close look at the country and its people. Many native Greenlanders are hunters. Some of the images are hard to look at, but it is a way of life in the harsh environment. Greenland is a beautiful country. It's not just the warming conditions that are changing the landscape. Big industry from many countries around the world, including Canada, the U.S., the U.K., and China, are setting their sights and hoping to gain political influence in the resource-rich country. You will hear a lot about Greenland in the coming months and years. We want to bring you the story first. In the far frigid north, the ocean meets jagged maritime glaciers. Soon, those glaciers in the rough terrain give way to what seems like an unending blanket of white. The Greenland Ice Sheet. Beautiful and serene. But here, along an imaginary line called the Arctic Circle, there is a very real problem. A meltdown like none ever recorded in this area of the world. It became like the, the thing to do in town, to go down and, and watch the, the, the massive amount of water going through. 
the Arctic is, is experiencing, uh, I would say, a crisis. The meltdown is changing long-held beliefs about the Arctic and its weather patterns, as well as being blamed for affecting conditions around the globe and triggering a rise in global sea levels. We have determined that this is occurring. Now we have to kind of figure out why this is occurring, and that's the difficult part. This water runoff from Greenland's melting glaciers and ice sheet is blamed for a frightfully large percentage of sea level rise, as much as 40 percent. Air Greenland's trademark red helicopters spent a hectic summer taking researchers back and forth to no man's land, the heart of the ice cap. I've noticed an increase in scientists coming up here talking about it. So that's how I know the, the ice is melting. The dramatic change has focused international attention on Greenland like never before. From all these collective studies of the whole Arctic region, you can see that it's warming much faster than the rest of the, of the planet. And what does this warming and subsequent meltdown mean? To begin with, Greenland is pretty much a mystery to the outside world. Its landscape, its environment, its people. Well, we don't have polar bears walking around in the, in the city. We don't eat, uh, eat uh, seal uh, blubber every day. It, it's a westernized uh, society, but there's a, a, a huge amount of culture that, that follows along. Greenland is coping with a generation gap. A large part of the population is steeped in traditional ways. Its youth, meanwhile, hoping for a future more connected to the rest of the world. And the younger generation is, is like uh, youngsters anywhere else. They uh, go on the internet, uh, they listen to YouTube, and they want something else. They want to be part of a, a, a westernized society, they want the same goods. For nearly 5,000 years, people of the Arctic, Inuits, have called Greenland home creating a society in a harsh environment. In one of the country's largest towns, Ilulasat, there are more sled dogs than people. It's hot. Uh, hot. Hot. Native Greenlanders are hunters. In the capital of Nook, you can find reindeer meat drying on the balcony of a crowded apartment complex. With halibut making up 60% of the money that comes in from export, they are also fishermen. Some are skilled in art that goes back centuries. European influence began creeping in during the early 1800s when Greenland was colonized by Denmark. Chances are you have no idea how many people live here. Just 57,000, making the largest island on Earth the world's least densely populated country. We don't have any roads, we don't have any trains. It's air transport, it's sea transport. Getting from one spot to the other isn't easy or cheap. Roughly a third of all Greenlanders live in the capital of Nook. Nook, like almost all populated towns, is located on Greenland's west coast. There are colorful homes squeezed into almost every available inch of livable real estate. The scenery speaks for itself. In the last few years, Greenland began gaining independence from Denmark. And now the country's leaders are opening up the country for oil and mineral exploration. When the ice is melting, there is more land getting exposed and it's easier to access uh, the minerals in the ice zone. Not everyone likes that. It's a shame. It's a shame for government in Greenland. I think it's very bad. Do you think that the government is for sale in a way? Yeah. The lake on the surface. So as this lake is filled, you know, there are cracks 
on the ice that they're not very deep. For legions of researchers like Marco Tedesco, massive melting and the changes it's fostering are all unchartered territory. In 2012, we had a new record set in terms of melting over the Greenland ice sheet. In just a few short but hot days in August, there was melting over 97% of the ice sheet, virtually the entire cap. No one saw it coming, not like this. Even more staggering considering the ice cap pushes up 3,000 meters above sea level. Tedesco is a professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the City College of New York. Think about it. The city in which he teaches has more people at any given moment milling around Times Square than in all of Greenland. An irony not lost on Tedesco. I felt that I was like the man stepping on the moon. And uh, I, what I clearly remember was the sound of the ice under my you know, boots. Uh, and the fact that, can I step here? Can I step there? I was almost afraid of breaking it. But that was a very strong uh, feeling and something that probably we remember uh, for, for the rest of my life. It is incredibly windy, incredibly cold, and incredibly beautiful and awe-inspiring to be standing here in Greenland's massive frozen wasteland. But here, amid this snow and ice, it's hard to believe that the ice sheet is melting as fast as scientists say. But it is, and this country is changing. Then suddenly you have a change into direction, but it goes very fast. Tedesco was able to capture on video something no one else had apparently ever recorded. But this is the bedrock, mm -hmm. okay? And this is your ice. And this is your water, so that we know. And then this water suddenly and violently drains through this channel, which is called Mulen, and it makes it larger and larger, and it starts draining all the water signal at the top. This is a, it's a catastrophic event. It's important because it's a symptom of an environment in flux. Studies show Greenland's ice cap is riddled with these mullets, and they could very well illustrate how the ice sheet is being carved up like Swiss cheese, and how this runoff could be one of the hidden keys to sea level rise. Scientists say we are watching the polar regions melt right before our eyes. So you can tell there's a stream here, and then there's a bunch of flow coming down on this right side. Many blame 100 years of pumping carbon dioxide from vehicles and factories into the atmosphere, fueling the greenhouse effect. How frustrating is it for you to hear people say, we don't know that this has been affected by man. This, mm -hmm. this could be cyclical. It's so frustrating. I, I don't feel frustrated. Um, I would waste my energy if I would be frustrated. It is something that we are responsible for, yes, uh, we as a humans. Is it something that we can do about something about it? Yes. Is it something that we should do something and are we doing? I'm not convinced. Understanding the summer's record melt-off and how it's apparently affected by carbon dioxide is important because the 1.8 million square kilometers of Greenland ice basically serves as a cooler for the Earth's atmosphere. And if you listen to scientists, the cooler is broken. I mean, think about it, you know, snow is this white reflective surface. And if you remove that, you know, that, that sunlight, the radiation that's coming in, it's not gonna be reflected back in the same way. It's gonna, it's gonna be absorbed by the ground. It's gonna warm it up. And the same with Arctic Ocean, you lose the sea ice, you lose the reflective properties. Uh, the, the, the water will be uh, even warmer and you'll melt more ice. And really see, like, the massive flooding. Oh, yeah. Osa Rennermann so is an environmental engineering professor at Rutgers University. She's trying to determine how all the melting is affecting the Earth's climate. Why what's going on up here 
is leading to subtle but serious changes in the environment everywhere on the planet. It's very hard to say, oh, there's, you know, these changes going on. So we just need to collect more data to understand the system. Like, OK, this was an extreme summer. And uh, is next summer going to be extreme again? Or, is, you know, we're going to see something different. We have 56,000 people here in Vietnam. Maybe in uh, the next 20 years, that will be more than a million people here in Finland. In contrast, native Greenlander Adam Lieber has watched his country and its landscape change bit by bit every day for years. He's a guide who drives tourists from the town of Kangalusua to nearby Russell Glacier. Lieber likes to boast that at 25 kilometers in length, this is one of the longest roads in all of Greenland. The road is long, but no one says it's smooth. There is perfect life. It's uh, very close to the nature. they one of the most silent places on Earth. And the air is not polluted. Lieberth believes his perfect life, his perfect world, is out of balance right now. He says this past summer alone, he watched Russell Glacier lose at least 30% of its mass. What do you think about the big change? Or do, do you worry about it? Do you think about it? Yeah, I think about it. Even for me, uh, each of the ice uh, in the past two years, the ice retiring nearly 300 meters back. It's even for me scary, for even my hair uh, rising up when I saw that, I think I'm beginning to think about it. And even for us, I calculate with the speed, maybe in the 40, 70 year in the century, we can probably cross from here to East Greenland without ice. That would be no ice. Liebert will be the first to say he's no expert. But there are a host of scientists gathering precise data. Yeah, there's plenty of observations. We used to see the glacier here, and now we don't. You might have some long-term measurements there, but GRACE quantifies that in the perspective of the entire ice sheets. NASA researcher Scott Lufty spends his life pouring over detailed information, interpreting the info that comes from satellites called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. In science circles, it's called GRACE. GRACE can detect the most subtle, minute changes in land ice, down to the width of a human hair. At the end of this decade that we're looking at, the last couple of years, we see very large anomalies in the melt season. So we're seeing larger and larger melt season losses. Lufke has put together sobering information covering the years 2003 to 2010. On average, average mind you, Greenland has lost 230 gigatons from the ice sheet every year. And for some perspective, about 80 gigatons is the uh, amount of water in the Chesapeake Bay. So nearly three times the amount of water in the Chesapeake Bay is being lost, that's equivalent water, is being lost in ice to the oceans every year on average over that time period. Think about that. On average, every year, Greenland has been losing three times the amount of all the water in the Chesapeake Bay and 2012 was no average year. It appears 2012 saw 40% more runoff than an average year. By any standards, it's a colossal amount. So what we see is significant loss. Most of that loss is coming from the margins of the ice sheet, the low elevations in the marine terminating glaciers. We've seen loss over that time period go from uh, persistent loss in the southeast going all the way up to the northwest now, and even in the north, we're seeing uh, significant loss. That's why we call it a Goliath year, because it really outstands above everything. Global warming? I think climate change instead. <laughs> because it's not just global warming. You have changes in precipitation, changes in extreme events. Extreme events could be triggering extreme conditions around the world. An estimated 15,000 record high temperatures were recorded across the United States this past summer. At the same time, Great Britain slogged through a horrifically wet season. 
and the northeastern United States will be rebuilding from a late season hurricane for years to come. The climate change that's manifested most uh, rapidly and, and strongest in, in the Arctic region right now. And here's also a region where you have some consequences that could ultimately uh, influence uh, the rest of, of the planet, such as the Greenland ice sheet with uh, raising sea levels. Scientists say the sea level is creeping up ever so slightly, less than two millimeters a year. It may not seem like much, but it could spell disaster when freakishly strong storms blow in. What does it matter if it's just this much more water in the oceans? The problem is that the storm surges will be much higher. I mean, already now you have issues with trying to protect the coastal areas, and, and that's just going to be a bigger problem. I mean, New York City is going to have a problem. It turned out to be incredibly prophetic. Just weeks after this interview, Superstorm Sandy unleashed its fury on the U.S. Northeast, including New York City. And why is what's happening in Greenland important? Scientists maintain at least a third of all global sea level rise is attributed to the melting heat. For centuries, people in Denmark have had a special relationship with Greenland, colonizing Greenland in the early 1800s. And in Copenhagen, there's a tribute to Knud Rasmussen, son of a Danish cleric and Inuit Danish mother. Rasmussen explored much of the country with sled dogs in the early 1900s, long before sophisticated satellites would map the rugged environment. And Copenhagen always ranks high on cities with the best quality of life. And it's one of the most environmentally friendly cities in the world. Roughly two million citizens in the metro area with a wealth of restaurants, entertainment, and Tivoli, a world famous amusement park. Many here fear a bumpy, unsettling future. Studies show the sea level could rise as much as a meter by the year 2100, having a punishing effect on waterfront city. And much of that fueled by Greenland. No, I don't think it is 100 years around. I think, I think it's happening much faster than anyone predicted. And what, what I think is, is, is the very worrying part is that when people think, oh, well, it's nothing to do with me, you know, we are all in this together. It is one world. Well, yeah, I'm concerned about global warming because I think it's happening. Um, the fact that most of the seasons are changing in a lot of different countries for the worse. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't use a car in Melbourne now for that reason. Really? Yeah. What will happen to Greenland's ice sheet in the coming decades, and how will it affect the rise in sea level? It's a global question, but one that is especially important in cities like Copenhagen, virtually surrounded by water. In talking with scientists and researchers, one thing is crystal clear. If we're going to understand the future, we must first determine how climate change has affected our past. Greenland is, 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 is a wonderful place because it holds a record of everything that happened on the planet since 3.8 billion years ago, almost 4 billion years. Minnick Rosing is a geologist at the University of Copenhagen and works at the Natural History Museum of Denmark. A native Greenlander, he's able to cull secrets from the earth. This long, thin black rock comes from an area in Greenland called Isua. Billions of years ago, it was just mud on the ocean floor. This is a sediment, which means that at one point in time, there's mud and, and, and sand that was deposited at the bottom of the ocean. This was actually the ocean floor 3.8 billion years ago. But what's special about this rock is that it contains the oldest traces of life we have on the planet. So it tells us that life has been with us, has been, been basically living in the oceans for more than 3.7 billion years. Some of Rosing's colleagues focus on ice, not rock. 
They have ice core samples that show how the Earth's climate has changed over tens of thousands of years. And they have unearthed an unnerving trend. What they have recorded is that there have been five melting events till now at this uh, site in, in, on, on the ice cap. And of those five, the four of them have been in the past ten years. So it's clearly there's something very unusual uh, happening. It's not just scientists trekking to Greenland. Let me take one more. Tourism is becoming more and more popular here. On any given day, boats navigate through icy waters off the coast of Ilulisat, putting people closer to drifting icebergs that come from Jakobshavn Glacier. Scientists and researchers have been studying Jakobshavn Glacier for more than a century and a half, dating all the way back to 1850. In fact, a large chunk broke off in the early 1900s, and an iceberg made its way from here into the North Atlantic. It would have melted into obscurity had that iceberg not crossed paths with a luxury ocean liner on her maiden voyage, the Titanic. What few realize is how rapidly Jakobshavn is retreating. More than 15 kilometers this past decade alone. Ice and Inuit culture are intertwined. Customs and traditions that are thousands of years old are being adversely affected from a significant meltdown. So Greenlanders like John Eliasson find they have more time to spend fishing for halibut on long lines. Since sea ice is melting, the fishing season is extended, but there is less time for hunters to take sled dogs out on the ice looking for seal. Today, Eliasson is happy. His fishing line is in the water, and his family will have seal meat after a quick stop on a rocky beach. The um, meat from the seal will feed your family? Yeah. You eat. You eat. Mm -hmm. And the skin you'll sell to the local shops? But sometimes uh, to talk. Sometimes so the dogs. Yeah. Nothing is wasted. Good, huh? Mm. Good? Good. I will try. Yeah, I'll try. Small piece. Small. <laughs> Not big. <laughs> you knew the word big. Yeah. This is liver? Yeah. Just. That's liver. <laughs> that takes getting used to. An adventure for me, but a dietary staple for people in Greenland. People here hunt seal, whale, and reindeer. And many bones and antlers wind up among a group of craftsmen in Alulisat who will make money off tourists. Christian Flew is the most celebrated artist in town, and his most treasured pieces are these, called tupalaks. Uh, he says in the old times they were used as a tool to curse your enemies, but now they are just used as a decoration in the home. Blue's work has been in art shows in France and the United States, but he leads a humble life. Like everyone in Greenland, Blue is keenly aware Greenland's environment is changing. It's very, very important to preserve the culture. But Flew says he's not nervous about its future, saying it's been preserved for a long, long time. <laughs> the town of Kangalusuak is divided by Watson River. Right now, it's tame. But notice the banks, the erosion, and workmen trying to repair the one bridge in town. This is what happened when record melting fueled record runoff. This year is the worst. Just this year? Yeah. Uh, the, the last uh, 2010, 2011 have been fantastic years. We get more and more guests here, 
but 2012, the, exactly the 11th of June, was the worst day in my life in Kangsusa. The hot summer turned Kim Ernst's life upside down. His restaurant, The Rowing Club, is on one side of the bridge, most of the town and its citizens on the other. And uh, 4.30, the police call us, and now we have 20 minutes to pack down because uh, there was something wrong with the bridge and the water was going over. Townspeople had never witnessed anything that rivals the bridge washout. Never, never. This is, I mean, I talked to people who lived in the town for 30 years. They've never seen anything like that. Obviously, during the lifetime of that bridge, something like that has never happened. <laughs> But people in Greenland are resilient. So what does it mean to finally be able to prepare this food again after the, the rotten summer you've had? That's fantastic. As is his spread of traditional Greenlandic food. This is muskox, and this is uh, minted muskox. This one is uh, lamb, Greenlandic lamb chop. And this one is reindeer sausage. And the reindeer sausage we make ourselves. <laughs> The first day he was able to reopen since the bridge washed away was memorable. Especially for the Russian helicopter pilots and flight staff who reserved the restaurant on this night. This is how the people of Greenland want you to see their country a pristine glacial lake surrounded by raw, rugged beauty. But there is a lingering hangover from this past summer's massive thaw, and a lot of people here are wondering, what's next? And I'm afraid for, with Greenland shall exist like Greenland are today, be the, a beautiful place with fresh air and no pollution. I don't think so. Do you want to see pipelines and machinery all over these mountains? No, then I go from here. Then I'm finished. Because the, my guests don't want to see that. My guests want to come and see what they see today. And what they see in the wintertime, a frozen lake. They can go out and ski on or sit down on the northern light in the evening. Many call it bad news. Many others say it is a blessing. The massive meltdown is opening up land. and industry giants want to tap into it for oil and mineral. Well, we were one of the first people in this big scale uh, projects. So we were at the forefront uh, of the developing uh, Greenland as a mineral uh, exporting country. Ebe Larsen's company may be at the forefront, but scores of others are playing catch up. There are now 120 permit requests for large scale mining and offshore oil exploration. Currently, there are no offshore oil rigs and only a few small mines. We want to help, be able to earn our own money and make our own living. According to the editor of Greenland's two newspapers, mining and oil will mean money for a country that just doesn't have much. We need um, to be economically independent of Denmark. We want our own economy. We don't have want to continue asking for money from Denmark. Denmark ceded some autonomy, but the Danes are still in charge of Greenland's foreign affairs, security, as well as financial control over the country. Here in this city, we need housing. We need uh, better health. We need, need better education. We need better communication. We need better infrastructure. It's a country of only 57,000. And a recent study showed a stunning 85% lack basic math and reading skills. Realistically, how can a government this small negotiate with companies that big? Aren't you worried that this country is going yes. to be taken advantage of and just be overwhelmed? Yes, we are very worried. And, and we as a newspaper is too small to investigate this company coming in. Horton Shalmi runs a Greenland-based company called Exploration Services that works with mining companies both large and small. 
He says Greenland's government is acutely aware climate changes are speeding up economic changes. And he says the government is taking steps to avoid mortgaging Greenland's future. If you want to come here and extract everything and then run away with the gold in your pocket, forget it. You'll never be accepted and you'll be caught in, uh, <laughs> in various uh, legal affairs. I imagine the uh, fishing here is amazing. Yeah. I don't say no minings in Greenland, but don't start uh, uh, like the place in, uh, in like no fjord. If we do it, then we can sell all Greenland to industry. And it's, it's bad. Peter Wong Tatusen says he truly feels like a voice in the wilderness. He's arguably the harshest critic of Greenland's push for widespread mining and oil exploration. Tatusen grew up near this body of water called New Fjord. New Fjord is, the, is a paradise in Greenland. He has been rallying support against a company that wants to build an iron mine in the shadow of New Fjord. That makes me angry in that way that they can just come in and overwhelm you. Yeah, occupied our country. And uh, I call it occupied our fuel because uh, uh, it's like occupying a uh, country. Uh, people have not informed uh, really as they should. And it, it's a shame. It's a shame for government in Greenland. I think it's very bad. Well, it's... Our concern is, is both with nature and environment and with the people of, or the, the society up here. They are building capacity as, as they go along, but it's, it's, it's fairly new and it's, it's just overwhelming. You have so many projects right now. It's the number of licenses that are, that are currently being worked on is, is amazing. And uh, you have all these town hall meetings, all these where you try to engage people in debates about it, but it's it's difficult to understand these projects. It's uh, the material is like you have a five pa five hundred page uh, environmental impact assessment. It's it's just hard work to understand these projects and, and very hard to see is this is this good for the, for the Greenland society as a whole or is this. Or should you be concerned? Meta Frost is the Greenland project manager for the World Wildlife Fund. Like many, she doesn't believe the debate would even be going on if Greenland's ice wasn't melting so quickly. With nature, of course, there's, there's a great concern that like, there'll be an oil spill, there'll be a leak. And if you imagine a, a spill of, of oil in an area like this, it'll just be devastating for fisheries and devastating for, for the whole yeah, area. There will be a lot of pollution in, uh, in water, in landscape uh, and uh, air. Uh, they told us, uh, engineers and uh, so, they told us there will not be, a, a, there will be a, a very small uh, uh, pollution. Uh, but uh, the, the fact the, the fact is that in uh, 10, 15, 30, maybe more no, years, there will be a lot of uh, uh, pollution in fjord and water and uh, air. So uh, we are very, very uh, concerned about that. Nook is essentially becoming a hub as Greenland's young leave small fishing and hunting towns and communities that dot the coastline. But you're seeing conflicts, new coming in, the old way of life going away. What's that like to see firsthand? Yeah, there's a, a trend of people moving from the smaller settlements into Nook, as you see in many other places around. Thomas the Joel Peterson works at Nook's Climate Research Center. The smaller communities are being depopulated and people moving to the bigger cities because there's better opportunity to, for jobs and uh, education and all these things and people are getting more aware of this. Mm -hmm. But now there's only one city that's growing, that's Nuke. Nuke, 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 Nuke. Climate change is accelerating this migration. Many are coming because they believe they'll find a better job. Working for one of the big mining companies that's setting up roots in Greenland. But when they get here, many transplants find the quality of life isn't better. 
That is, if they can find an apartment. Um, and the waiting list could easily be like 20 years, depending on what kind of, of flat you want. Um, and 20 years? Up to 20 years, yes. Uh, that's not unusual. So it's not very easy to find a place to live. Uh, then you have a lot of private uh, investors that actually have flats that they do want to rent. But uh, um, in Greenland, it's, um, it's quite common that when you come to Greenland, if you come from Denmark or from another country and you get a job here, then your employer will um, provide you with a place to live. So all the private investors that have flats, they do rent, they only want to rent them to companies, not to private people. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to find a place to live here unless you can buy your own place and um, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. There are some apartments to buy, according to real estate agent Marion Berger Rasmussen. But many are being snatched up by big companies preparing to do business in Greenland. Well, a two-bedroom flat in, in Nuuk, if you want, uh, some of the newer things, uh, is above two million kronas. In U.S. dollars, you're talking 300,000? Mm, well, yes, 300, 350,000 dollars. To put that in perspective, the same two-bedroom house or apartment in any other town in Greenland would probably only cost 10 to 15,000 U.S. dollars. So along with melting ice, the cultural landscape is changing dramatically, and maybe for good. What do you make of the people who portray what happened this summer as a catastrophic event, the harbinger of things to come? Are they making too much out of it too soon, or is there realistic concern that man has affected the climate to the point where we need to make some dramatic changes? I think that for sure that we have affected the climate, whether it's catastrophic or not. That's, I think that's too early to say. Taking the uh, minimum uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean, for instance, that this is probably not the lowest we will see. Like this will probably in the future go even, become even smaller extent of the sea ice. So I don't think that we have seen the most extreme of what we experience and as we were talking about as well that the climate seems to be more in an in a flux stage right now it's not so stable we see more of these extreme events the coldest uh, month on record the warmest month on record the strongest storms the uh, numerous storms these mm -hmm. these things are just indications that the climate is in a in a state of flux it's changing all the more reason the world and its scientists need to understand Greenland and what's happening here. If we're gonna make policy, we better have damn good numbers. And we better be able to project those and forecast those at some degree of accuracy and confidence. And that degree of confidence should have a number. It should be quantified. So we can, the country can do, and society can do better policy. <laughs> A massive ice sheet that will spell disaster if melting continues unabated. If all of it would melt tomorrow, it would raise global sea levels with about seven meters. All right, that's a lot of, of water, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen over the next hundred years. But even just a fraction of that amount of ice melting uh, over the la next 50 years could have consequences for, for people living everywhere on the globe. On the ice cap, it's easy to feel far removed from a pending crisis. Many scientists are absolutely sure a century of burning fossil fuels has heated the atmosphere and led to serious and significant environment changes. It's just easiest to notice up here. Governments say they want to find a way to turn back the clock and undo the damage. Greenlanders are very aware in the short term their sparsely populated country could actually benefit. But the immediate reality is there is no easy solution if there is one at all.
disappear. It's easy to feel like the last man on Earth and know this block of ice could lead to a world of changes. Thanks to Sean Calebs for that report. That brings us to the conclusion of our broadcast. Please join us again next week for another edition of America's Now. See you then.